Okay, so we're back and finishing up chapter 13, triangles and quadrilaterals, and today we're going to focus on the indexed polygonal nodes. Same nodes as before, same functionality, but uh, this time with indices for our triangle set, triangle pan set, triangle strip set, and, tri and quad set, each time an indexed version. Okay, so let's look at indexed triangles at note. Uh, once again, lots of triangles, but a different sequencing of how we count the points and how we turn them into triangles. Uh, it's still a child uh, coordinate node holding all these values. That's been consistent in every case. But in this, this time we have index array values that are pointing to which point in the coordinate array are used for each triangle. So you'll get a set of three indices pointing to three points, and then you'll get a negative one value saying that's it for, for that one. Excuse me, I, I take that back. Then you don't need a negative one value because it's three points for every triangle, so there you go. It's just building triangle, 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 triangle but it builds each by indexing. Here are the three indexes for the first, here are the three indices for the second, three indices for the third, etc. Okay, so uh, this makes it a little more efficient than the uh, non-index, the simple ordered nodes that we studied early, earlier. Because if you do have a coordinate node with all the points you want, since we're often building a mesh, that connects uh, a whole space, you often need to reuse vertices to say, well, here's the triangle on this side, here's the triangle on that side, here's the triangle on the other side of this single point. So you no longer have to redefine that same point three times for everything, but rather you can just have the XYZ values once in the coordinate node and the index points there. So it is pretty efficient. So if we look at this guy now, um, what do we have? Well, our example is named, uh, as you might expect, index triangle set. And then we have uh, our coordinate node and our color node, just as before. And then we have our index triangle set itself right there that just has index values that are pointing into those arrays. So here are the index values highlighting. And uh, we can see, okay, well, this one was pretty simple. We had the same uh, coordinates right in order. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7, 8. This is how it would look in the interface right there as compared to what's there. And of course, our child coordinate node is where we put all those values in. All right, so let's take a look at the interface on this guy. <coughs> and indexed triangle set. We'll open it up a little bit. There's our node of interest, child coordinate, child color. So if I go to the triangle set and edit it. Sure enough, we see that it's got all of the same basic fields that we share with the other guy. You can see the solid tooltip popping up there. And it also has a very simple array uh, for where uh, the values go. look at it. So I'll bring this window out. And we'll refresh it. And sure enough, here are our three triangles. views. You can see they each have three different colors and you can also see that they have uh, uh, consistent coloring for each one. So let's see how that works. Uh, our in 
indexing works the same for both the points and for the colors. So these colors are going to get associated in order as well. Okay, so if we look at our counting checks here, we would want to have the uh, sufficient number of colors and coordinates in each one. So let's take a look at our coordinate node. This goes 0 through 9, so it looks like we have one extra point here, because uh, that's a total of 10. Actually, uh, I take that back, that's a lot more. There's 33 points there. So we obviously just copied this uh, coordinate node from another example. And in fact, I guess what we could do is let's experiment with this and see if we can't knock it on down. Since we are only using nine coordinate points and nine colors in there, let's test our interface. And we'll start at the bottom, and we'll just go, uh, well, wait a second, wait a second before I do that. You can see that there's 18 here. 18, that sounds suspicious. Why would that be? Well, no, I guess that's fine. If we have nine vertices, then all we, the most we might need is nine colors. Right now, we're just using the first two colors, it looks like. So let's, uh, let's delete the bottom ones and work our way up. I'm going to highlight that, and the minus is our delete button. So we'll just bring them on down. Let's see if we can't get rid of a bunch at once. I'm highlighting three rows at once. Delete. Well, it's still only deleting one at a time, but at least I don't have to reselect. Okay, so we'll save that. Like we didn't break anything. Now we'll do a similar step in the coordinate node. Okay, so we only need the first nine. So we'll get rid of the rest of these guys. Refresh. And it looks like we still have our three triangles. This is uh, interesting in that we have both a material and a color. So if we wanted to, we could simply get rid of the appearance and the color. I think that would be uh, better because uh, that way there'd be no mix up about who's in charge. Okay, and let's re-render that. Okay, there we go. And finally, we'll go back to the index triangle set. And notice it does say color per vertex, but we're not observing that in these triangles right here. So we may have uncovered a small bug in uh, XJ3D. Let's launch this bad boy across all the, bra all the browsers and see how they do. Well, that certainly looks a lot more like color per vertex to me. There's the color per vertex. Color per vertex for Octaga. Looks like it's fixed in the newer version of uh, XJ3D that we're beta testing externally. So we don't have to report a bug today. We'll uh, hopefully get that cleaned up when we upgrade the XJ3D. Right now we're working on milestone one from June and we're about to drop in the uh, November update. Okay, so I'll revise this scene. We changed it today. We just tested it just fine. So I'll check it in the version control. And the reason for this change.
exchange was a nifty extraneous coordinate points. And colors. And we also removed the duplicative, redundant <coughs> material. Okay, which frankly might have been what confused XJ3D over here in this version. So that's that. Let's go to our, our next scene then. Double check our warnings to see if we saw anything new there. Nope, looks all pretty good. Pretty predictable, pretty consistent across each of these nodes. All right, so we're up to our next node. If the previous one was uh, index triangle set or ITS, then this would be abbreviated ITFS and uh, same as triangle fan set but indexed this time. So same functionality, different way of counting. So in this case we do have negative one sentinel values. Why? Because it's no longer single triangles but rather a fan and therefore each polygon will be around that common vertex but we don't know necessarily how big it is, so we have to uh, put a fan in. Okay, let's, uh, what the heck, let's tweak the slides a little bit and put that nice little fan fixture picture in there on the other one. I didn't think that was necessary before, but it actually probably will improve this slide a little bit to help people remember. What the heck's a fan? Once again, the indexing, the primary benefit of this is it lets us be more efficient and not duplicate points. That efficiency does have a slight cost, however, uh, for every three points you reduce, you're adding another index, a single integer value as opposed to three point and floating point value. So all in all, it's, a, it's definitely a net win. But, uh, the basic nature of a fan being small and contained in a local place and how many triangles can you really squeeze in with a common center, that won't change either. So just the nature of fans will stay pretty pretty much small ball, small scale. Just uh, you can only make fans so big and then it's time to do another fan. Okay. You can have multiple fans in this node though. We simply separate each fan by that negative one, and that's how it knows when it's done with the first fan and can move on to the second one. So here we see uh, that same fan, same fan actually, but this time with an indexed mode of doing business. Notice how this index is using the same color and coordinate point, but uh, we didn't get rid of the unused ones, rather we just kept them there and pointed to values that are farther down in that coordinate node. So we definitely don't want to remove points or remove colors for this guy or it would change all the indexing around. If we found that there were more than 32 in there, we could get rid of those extra ones afterwards. But if you get rid of the ones before, then you'd have to change your indices to match. Uh, what are those indices? Well, here they are blocked out. You can see in each of those uh, red boxes that uh, uh, they terminate with the minus one character. So uh, there it is there, and there it is there. That's how we blocked out each array. And if we uh, look at the coordinates, 
We have, uh, if you look closely at your color display or your color printout, you'll see that the uh, ones on the left are in black and the ones on the right are in blue. And sure enough, those numbers match the two different sets here. Okay, so black numbers. 18, 19, 20, 21. You can see that 19 is missing on the plot here because it was so close. But there's 19 right there. Similarly, 19 right there. 21, 22, 23. The whole key to each of these is what's the center of the fan? So our fan centers here are 18 and uh, 27. Okay, uh, warnings, uh, nothing particularly unusual there. Let's pull the scene back up. Just double check our interfaces. <laughs> okay, so if we pull up our editor for index triangle fan set node, we can see, yes again, very simple. All we have to add in here is the index value. Now, if you were wanted to, if you did want to, say, reduce the number of points as we did in the previous exercise, previous example, then let's take a look at that. We'll go to the coordinate and we'll say, how many do we have? 33 total, it goes to index 0 to 32. So it looks like these were all used, but since we started at which index, our lowest index here was number 18, that means there's 17 floating point values, 7 times 3 floats, that's not, tr not bad, I mean it wouldn't matter much in file size, but for big scenes that had lots of these with extraneous points, it could be pro problematic. So, uh, how could we get rid of them? Well, two ways. One is simply by uh, brute force, manually delete each one of them that you didn't need. And, and need I mentioned very carefully. You say, how do you do that? Very carefully. But uh, you would then also have to go back to, sorry, I'm jumping around here. You'd have to go back to that parent index triangle fan set, and edit these. So if we deleted the first 0 through 17 coordinates, then we would have to subtract 18 from each of these numbers so that they would, again, start from 0 for our curve. So there'd be a lot of counting and arithmetic and, gee, a lot of places to make an error in there. Second way you could do this is uh, you could pick a tool. There are tools that will do this for you. Oh, arithmetic, keeping track of things. Computers are very good at that. So uh, we don't have that feature, but uh, uh, Chisel, the Chisel tool does. And the third approach to getting rid of them is uh, don't. Say, why are they there in the first place? If you're saying, well, I've got a lot of fan sets that um, I'm making, a lot of index triangle fan sets, or maybe index triangle sets, and index triangle strip sets, all of these things. Well, hey, let's def and use our coordinate node to find one big mother of all coordinate pile of points node at the beginning, just one single node, def it there, and then use it each time afterwards when we want to refer to that and then we can have nice, small index triangle fan set nodes with just a handful of indices created where you want them, and that might work. Okay, so it's an option. It's an option for you. What's the right way? Well, your mileage may vary. So do the right thing. Here's, here are the questions you can go through and a way to figure it out. Okay, back to the slide. It's up here somewhere. And let's check our notes on this. We've got the note that the vertex wasn't labeled. Oh yeah, 
here's a curiosity of some of these things. We're talking about attention to detail. Uh, for some of these, color per vertex is always ignored and treated true. Uh, the reasons for that are pretty arcane, pretty obscure. Uh, it's just the way it is. I think, I think the rationale was that's the way these things are uh, underneath. Uh, way they were implemented, nobody wanted to bother, but I'm not quite sure. In any case, it does say that in the spec, so it's not an oversight. So uh, if you want to get color per polygon, then you would either be re-indexing those colors for each point, or maybe if it's all one color you're looking for, simply use a material node, possibly split it out. If you want an example of what a fan looks like, this is taken from, uh, I simply shot a cylinder and kept the end cap visible and the sides not, and then put it in wireframe mode. So uh, that gives you an example of how uh, pen sets can actually be pretty helpful, like drawing circles, for example. Just get however many points you want there. That'll be an efficient representation. Uh, if you're looking for a project, for this chapter, that would be a nice programming problem, is write a little loop that computes uh, x, y coordinates uh, around a circle and pick your radian or angular uh, increment for how many points you want and then simply define all those points and then define the indices. Given that we define the points like that in your program, Then the next step of your program would be to define the fan set indices. So if this was 0, and this was 1, and that was 2, etc., then that would give you this. Adding a point there gives you that. Adding a point there gives you that, etc. So obviously our index array here is pretty darn simple. It's just 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 27 or however many points you decided to use on this thing. Okay. Of course, uh, if you're writing a program to do that, you can write it in any language because you could simply output the values to cut and paste into X3D Edit, cut and paste into your scene, or print out, copy your scene into your, your program and give it a bunch of print statements and have it just print out your program and insert the numbers where they belong. Okay, so I hope you feel empowered if you're using uh, MATLAB or Java or C or even Excel spreadsheets, you could write little programs to compute values and build geometry for yourself. Okay. Uh, all right, so those are our notes for those nodes. And after index triangle fan set comes index triangle strip set. All right, so we've seen a strip set. We know that, uh, let's copy that picture again. Uh, pictures are good, right? There's a nice strip set picture. So hard it was. So just a series of strip sets. There's a single strip set there. You could make multiple strip sets. So it's not hard to imagine that you might create a whole uh, big piece of stuff simply by doing other uh, strip sets. Um, going point to point and coloring in the other using a dotted line to indicate how a triangle gets defined from that. Add a point here, go back to that point there. And so that's how the triangles would get filled in, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So do I recommend you sit around building those uh, strip sets? 
No, I think that uh, usually that's done by tools where you're building more complex geometry. They would perform that kind of tessellation, creation of polygons. But uh, nevertheless, it's an option to you. You can certainly author them if you want, and given the data you might have measured from uh, from an object or or collected from another source, it might be the best way to go for these. Okay. So as before, uh, three triangles make the three coordinates make the first triangle, and then each point that we add, point D, point E, point F, create another triangle. Okay, so this is quite efficient as before. Now here is our actual example scene. Now let's see, I think uh, we have all of the points in a row right there, but if we closely look at the index array, we see there are negative one delimiters on each guy here. Those two negative one sentinel values indicate, okay, we're done with the first strip set and it's time to go to the second strip set. And otherwise, if we had gotten rid of, say, that minus one right there, if you deleted that, then the first polygon strip would be connected to the second polygon strip. And so if, if this was the last point, actually we can tell even better here. Let's get our indices uh, on the screen. Here they are, okay, so now if there was no negative one between 13 and 14, then that means 13 was connected to 14, and further that it uh, uh, connected a uh, triangle back to there, to the preceding one. Similarly, when we went to, uh, let me use the dotted line convention to uh, indicate that. So 13 is connected to 14, then our dotted line back would fill in that triangle right there. And then if 14 is connected to 15, our dotted line back would connect to 13. And so then of course we continue on. So the negative one breaks the strip, starts a new strip. But if you left out a negative one, you could see it would still be a strip. It would still keep on going and we would just get these two triangles here inserted in the mix. Added to our strip. Okay, so that's how it works. No grand surprises in the tooltips. We'll pull up our example. Index triangle strip set. And sure enough, looks looks like our example. We check our interfaces. Pretty straightforward. There's that minus one. Uh, Chris, here's an interface idea I haven't uh, hadn't thought of before. Maybe what do you guys think about this? Uh, if it's possible, should we uh, color these guys? Maybe it would be interesting if the negative ones were highlighted so they stood out a little bit. Okay, so we'll see if we can't. You like that if you can? Okay. okay. Maybe bold it. We'll, we'll look at some kind of highlighting background or, or changing color or something. So please add that to the notes as an interface enhancement we might try to accomplish. It might be more trouble than it's worth. You know, like right now that's a pretty easy to implement interface where we're just tossing integers into a text box. But uh, we'll, we'll think about it. Okay, and coordinate and color we're all familiar with. You can see that. Uh, I went through the exercise in the first. I'm not going to try to clean up these one, each one of these to get rid of the unused ones because frankly that was part of the uh, appeal of these examples. Uh, Leonard just made a nice big pile of coordinates and a nice big pile of points and then we created different shapes out of that same pile. So 
that might help you if you're tracking this stuff. Okay, I think we're all set here. So what's left? We did index triangle set, index triangle band set, index triangle strip set. Okay, just one more to go, and that's index quad set. So what is this guy? We should think that it's very similar, once again, first similar to the quad set, simple node that we saw before, where we're defining quads or rectangles, hopefully planar, and then we use, instead of just four points, four points, four points, we have a pile of points and we use four indices, four indices, four indices. Just like the simple index triangle set, where it's only a triangle, not a triangle fan, not a triangle strip, but a triangle, we only needed three indices and no sentinels before. Well, similar here. Always a quad, always four points. That means each four indices define a quad, and we don't need that negative one to say, split this one before you do the next one. Okay, so that's what it says right here. And we end up with uh, an efficient way to do things. There is a gotcha, though, for uh, those obscure spec reasons. We uh, definitely want to pay attention to that, that uh, you've got to put a CAD geometry level one component statement into your scene, or else the browser will disavow all knowledge of your index quad set node. Okay, so let's look at it. We've got two uh, quads, two rectangles. All the initial considerations in this chapter about maintaining planar polygons, very important. You still got to remember that. And uh, if we look at the index array, then sure enough, four indices, four indices, two quads get pulled out of the pile of coordinates, and there are no negative one sentinel values to split them out. We see that same thing in the interface right here. And uh, I guess a similar comment for the notes, uh, try to highlight or bold or color the text. That would be a convenience to the author. There are the index points. Pretty predictable. Those are correct. I've checked them. And what's left? Well, let's, uh, just to be thorough, let's go to our interface and make sure we've got it. So index quad set, there's our scene. There it is, not working. Not working silently in XJ3D. Let's launch it. wants to call it a day early here, I think. So we'll let them all fire up. Okay, Swirl did well. Vivity no joy. Octago looks good. XJ3D, not so good. And uh, bit management contact, not at all either. Okay, let's cross check these guys. Uh, we've brought this up once or twice before. We've got two pages uh, on our wiki, one for tool support and also the player support. So let's go to the player support page. You can just find this right on our uh, wiki site at web3d.org. It's also listed where uh, you do the browser plugin download. But let's see how they support it. Uh, 
we are seeing for CAD geometry, which would include, include quad set and index quad set, the CAD geometry, well, contact says yes, but we didn't see index quad set a moment ago, did we? No. Uh, instant reality, that did fine. Octaga did fine. Swirl did fine. XJ3D, that didn't work either. Okay, so uh, who wants to do bug reports? <laughs> let's see what else. Uh, let's uh, go down to the rest of this component, and that would be uh, uh, these nodes. Actually, I believe we're all in the rendering component. Let's check that. Let's go to the rendering component. I could be incorrect, though. Yeah, there they are. Index triangle fan, and strip and triangle set, and then similarly we have triangle set and there are index nodes, there are triangle nodes. Let's see how the browsers did on claiming that. Well, you can see that some of them were guarded in there. Who was right? Who was wrong? Well, I'll let you guys uh, post some bugs if you want. When you see this video, no doubt things will have gotten even better than they are today. And uh, you'll be able to tell. Or protest. Post that bug. Post that query to the list. Hey, I can't get my quads to come up. Is this a problem with my scene or a problem with my browser? Okay, so I think these pages are pretty helpful and, and this has been up a little over a month now, maybe five weeks and well that's cool, 7,000 times already. Uh, so I think we're starting to see some interest out there. Alright, home stretch. Final section on additional resources. Uh, there is a tool in there, the CAD filter converter, that will do some of that uh, data reduction for you. You can see that two of them are highlighted there, index face set to index triangle set, and then further reduction of tri index face set to uh, simple triangle set. Which one's right? Well, you look at the trade-offs for those nodes and then look at your geometry and decide which could give you the best fit. Since these are automated features, that will work well. And this is a panel that's launched from inside of X3D Edit right now, some of those things. Uh, Here's a text output. That panel exposes command line functionality, a shell script, and a batch file called converter that comes with XJ3D. Also a help file in there, converter help. So we've simply listed the incantations, the invocation uh, format for this uh, CDF filter, how you use it. OK, uh, what other features? That's uh, pretty simple, but helpful, but the mother tool here is Chisel. Chisel is unbelievable, and it has a lot of great stuff in it, and uh, it deserves a, maybe a lesson in its own right, because there's so many capabilities in there. Uh, you do have to uh, pay attention, though. Unfortunately, Chisel, at least not yet, does not work in X3D's XML format, so you would have to convert back into Vermal syntax and then do all your chisel modifications and then re-import it back into the .x3d syntax. So, uh, gee, if we had .x3d, we'd certainly love to integrate it because it is open source Java. Maybe someday. Maybe one of you wants to help uh, the guys at the uh, Halden Virtual Reality Center in Norway uh, accomplish that feat. Uh, here's a partial snapshot of all the major features that are in there. Uh, the most obvious on the right hand side is you can look at your source. Again, it's the classic thermal <coughs> syntax, but uh, it should be eminently familiar to you because all the words and numbers are the same. Uh, pound sign meets comment. That's where things turn green. Otherwise, it's color coded. On the left, we can see a long, long, long list of features how you could reduce, or resize, or rearrange, or somehow improve your file and then bring it back into there. It's also very good at keeping statistics as it goes of how much space did you get, 
How much size reduction when white space was squeezed out? How much white how much size improvement when polygons were flattened, meaning you have two or three or seven polygons that are almost exactly the same, let's make one big polygon out of them. If that sounds like an obscure case, well actually it's not, because if you're using a laser scanner or some other automated geometry production techniques, they're often producing lots of small triangles that, guess what, are just part of a single flat surface. So that kind of geometric compression can be very helpful. What else can you do? If you want to work down at this low level, well, you don't have to work in X3D, uh, where a lot of this work is done by most graphics people, graphics experts, is they're writing OpenGL source code. So I'm not telling you to go start writing OpenGL. Gosh, one of the whole motivators for X3D was you don't need to do that anymore. But if you really care about triangles, this is a good source to go look at. There's a lot of information there. You can go look at any of these uh, uh, resources, links on here, and find tons of algorithms, tons of working code that you might adapt to your own work and produce uh, triangles the way you want. Okay, so here's our summary. We made it all the way through. We saw that there's a lot of consistency in this chapter in that we have to uh, note our common fields. They are consistent as before, but hopefully you should, you've nailed each and every concept now as in our last geometry chapter. We learned about normals for perpendicular vectors as a special coloring and shading technique. Then we learned about our uh, three types of no uh, four types of nodes, triangle set, triangle fan set, triangle strip set, and quad. And then we do it two different ways. We do it either ordered, meaning the points must be in the order that you want them drawn, or indexed, meaning the points can be in any order, and the index tells you what is the proper order when you construct the triangles and quads you want. I'm sure you've figured this out by now. Pay attention. There's a lot of subtle details in these. None of them are hard, but they all have their little quirks and idiosyncrasies. So double check when you do these to make sure it works. Here are suggested exercise. Uh, uh, gee, build a box. That'll, that'll teach you if you can do it or not. Or a platonic solid. Uh, we also have Archimedean solids, but platonic solids are pretty cool and that's uh, where you have regular polygons that uh, each side are exactly the same. Archimedean solids are similar to that. Uh, where the sides might be two types of polygons that are repeated in order. Um, I'm hoping someday we might have a um, archive of platonic solids. I think that would be a good thing. What other uh, projects were there? Uh, write a small program that's just printing out text that you either cut and paste into your 3D scene once you got that working, then copy that scene back into your program, have the print lines output your X3D file, have your code insert the values that you want right in there. That's a great exercise that you'll probably be very glad you did because you can reuse it in lots of different classes, lots of different modeling capabilities. Uh, why not put a quad together and go back and try applying textures to it, see how that works. You could also uh, manually convert an index base set that you had elsewhere into triangles. Just going through the which point was where and what order and what's my syntax can help you nail that comprehension. And finally, if you get uh, uh, satisfied with your skills that you don't have to do it manually anymore, uh, then go ahead and use XJ3D or even Chisel to build something. Uh, most of the standard references that we've seen before uh, uh, in the Verbal Source Book, Chapter 13 is the one that uh, accounts for this. And if you look hard for triangles and quads and don't find them, that's because they weren't there. What uh, Chapter 13 talks about is index base set and some of the other nodes. We did not have these triangle quadrilateral nodes 
back in Burma, they were added by popular demand. And if you go into uh, OpenGL or look at other hardcore programmatic algorithms and references where you want to compute your geometry and spit out points, well, here are two excellent uh, resources for that. The Graphics Gem series is, uh, uh, each book has, uh, what would be, what's a good average, maybe five dozen, four to six dozen contributions per book jacket? At, at least. At least. It's, it's a huge resource. And many embellishments by the editors. Amen. If you go online, you can, or if you go into the notes here, you'll find the links to that. And the code's available online. Uh, finally, I'm still working my way through this top book, but it's very cool. Uh, Daniel Petto uh, uh, goes through a bunch of, goes through history and finds out who the great geometers were. So I'm, I'm starting the chapter on Leonardo da Vinci right now, having finished uh, Euclid and uh, some others. And there's some uh, cool references on Wikipedia. Okay, so we're all done with this chapter. One more to go, prototypes, maybe the most exciting chapter for masters of X3D. We'll see you then.